celebrating 16 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Daniel Hood, Part 1. Welcome to Anything is Possible. This is Daniel Hood. Daniel, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I was in a department store. I'm a beefy guy. <laughs> guy walks up to me and he says, how big a boy are you? <laughs> <laughs> you are a big guy. How tall are you? Um, I just tell me about your size. Um, you know, I, I think I'm in that 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six range. I've lost a little weight since playing football, so we're down 20, 30 pounds and still in that 280 range. Wow. So, thank, thank you for being here today. No, I'm excited. I'm excited to be here. Knoxville Catholic High School? Mm -hmm. Tell me about growing up in Knoxville and playing high school ball here. Uh, well, it's, I actually grew up in Kingsport, which is uh, about 100 miles, of course, east of here. And, uh, but Knoxville was incredible. You know, I got to play with guys like Harrison Smith, Zach Tate, um, and really that Catholic community. I don't think you can really beat. Um, you know, when it, when it was our night against Webb, you get 15,000 people there. And, uh, um, and everyone there was just so awesome and just gave you the keys or, or gave you the, the chance to be successful. All you had to do was act on it at that oh, point. Yeah, do act on it. Yeah. Talk about growing up in Kingsport. Uh, Kingsport was fun. Um, I, I grew up to, to, to separated parents in, in East Tennessee. Um, government housing, rent was a dollar a month, you know, so poor that you, you really didn't know <laughs> that you were. Uh, so you were uh, in government housing. Oh, yeah. Um, and literally our rent was a dollar a month. And I tell people all the time, like I remember government peanut butter. And I don't know if anyone remembers, but literally so thick that when you try to spread it on bread, it, it literally just, the bread. It just rolls the, uh, the <laughs> bread up with it. And, uh, um, but it, it was things like in that area that, that really set the foundation for, for where we were gonna go. You know, I had an awesome, awesome mom that uh, um, you know, knew the importance of, of education and that stuff because she didn't have it. You know, she didn't have someone to really to, to give her that, that guidance when she was growing up. And, uh, and so as we're going through uh, all these reading clubs and book clubs and, and things like that, we didn't know it at the time, but she's learning to read with us. And so she didn't know how to read. Uh, she was just it, it wasn't barely good. literate. Yeah. But she was teaching you how to read. Yep. But she was learning how to read. Yep. As she, when you think back about that, what does yeah. does that do to you, and what does it do for you? To me, it, it's just a sign of respect, and I think it sets a standard for when I do have kids. You know, what type of parent that I want to be, what being a parent, you know. Um, your standards, your expectations, how you care for your kids, and, and things like that, that, literally whatever it takes. And, and that's really how I, I've approached life. And, and of course, now that she's, she's passed, um, it gives, gives you so much respect that no matter what it came to, she would sacrifice anything to make sure that the next day, me and my brother at that time were a little better than we were the day before. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and, and, and so we just try to tape that every single day, and we, we talk about it. Um, Growing up in, in government housing mm -hmm. in Kingsport, yep. rent a dollar a day, yep. roll up peanut butter, right? Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what were you imagining for your life? Did you want to escape? Did you want to get out of there? Did, did that make you want that? Uh, you know, really not, because it was, uh, uh, we just always wanted to. It was all you knew. Yeah, yeah, it was all we knew. And, and so, I mean, yeah, you'd go to school, you'd get made fun of. You know, we'd be, we'd brag about things. We called it 10 Cent Fridays at Salvation Army, where, I don't know if you know this, but um, at, at the Salvation Army we had in town, whenever they opened until 11 a.m., everything was 10 cents. And so that's where you got your clothes. And then, but Friday at 11, everything goes back up to 59 cents and they bring out all the new stuff. And so like, that's the kind of stuff that we get excited about. We'd get excited about, we had some, some woods behind us. You know, it's Christmas time. We're literally out there with a steak knife cutting down a Christmas tree because we can't afford one, you know, to put up and, and things like that. And so- With a steak knife? Yep. And uh, I mean, the tree, it was probably two or three inches in diameter. It took me and my brother a couple hours, but we finally got it down, finally brought it back. And, uh, uh, and really that's just what, you know, what we did. We just tried to live in the moment. And that's what mom taught us is it's, it's not about exceeding your expectations or, or things like that, but it's about living it and appreciating it. And, and now moving to where I am now, 
you know, there's things that, you know, yeah, it does. Like, it, it does give me that sense of, you know, we've made it from here. You know, we never forget it. We always appreciate it. Uh, and, and we can do things like spend a little more on clothing, spend a little more on things like that. Um, but the appreciation of it is not really because of the clothes. It's just kind of one of those things like, man, I finally, I've made it out of this. Let's help someone else in it. Wow. Let's take a break right here. Daniel Hood is my guest. This is an incredible story of possibility, and we're just getting started. More in a moment. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up. After my junior season, he made a highlight film. I didn't even think I was good enough to have a highlight film that year. And then I ended up getting, I think it was 28 offers. And this stuff is you can't outrun who you are, your past. Um, I lost 27 of them. Kingsport, Tennessee, living in public housing. Rent was a dollar a month. He has a love to this day for peanut butter. Good, <laughs> thick peanut butter. Gotta get the gym. <laughs> now he's, he's upgraded, right? Yeah. Uh, but he's here with us today, and, and thank you for sharing your story. Um, let's talk about the, the sport of football. Yes, um, sir. When did you have your growth spurt? Um, I was big on my life, and so I played sports. That was always, uh, you know, my equalizing factor. Yeah, you can be rich, you can be poor, you can be anywhere in between. But when it came to the football field, you know, those are your teammates, those are your brothers. And, and so growing up, I was shy. I was kind of uh, an introvert type person. And, and some of that really came to, to, to how we grew up. But the one thing that it was always football. How am I going to, that was my equalizer. How am I going to be equal with you? How am I going to equal with that person? And it's football. And so. So you started playing football at what age? Four. I was four. four. Yeah. And so the funny story, it was, uh, um, we, you know, when I was young, I really wanted to learn how to play the piano. Loved Elton John, huge fan. In fact, going to his concert here soon. But uh, I, I, I can remember my mom telling me a story. My dad said, uh, you know, no son of mine's going to play the piano. Stuck me in football. And so we started playing football and basketball and all that. And, you know, the rest kind of history at that. Let's talk about the first time you realize, wait a minute, I've got enough skill or I'm developing enough skill to play at the next level. You know what's funny is it really didn't happen until high school. My entire time growing up thought I was going to be a really good basketball player, thought I was going to be a really good wrestler and uh, uh, and I was really good at, at, at both of those. Wrestling was probably my, my best sport um, uh, and of course coming from a dad who was a tough man fighter it kind of to fit in the uh, the, the realm of it, but let me let me pause right there in, yeah. in that pocket in the story. Your dad was a tough man fighter. Tough man fighter. So what did he do? He, uh, um, I mean, he'd go around and he'd fight. So back in uh, back in that time, they would have uh, these fights around town, and it's kind of like modern day UFC. The right. only the only difference is you only get you can't stay on the ground for more than three seconds. And dad never lost a fight. And dad's my size, grew up one of seven, and so I always had to fight for his things growing up as well. And when he got in the ring, that was also his version of that equalizer. And towards the end of his career, he'd put his name on there. People would start taking their names off. So they'd have to pay him to not fight. So, wow. And, and so that was that mentality that they do you think you Do you think you absorbed some of his intensity? Did oh, he yeah. show up? Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the last season I wrestled, 27-1 um, national championship, four different state championships that we won in, in different states because we traveled a little bit for it. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I was pretty tough on the mat. And I was, I was big too. I mean, you got to think eight years old and 230 pounds. So, so you said though, but it wasn't until you got to high school yep. that you thought maybe I got some division one abilities that are emerging yep. here. So I, uh, um, I had, uh, um, again, Catholic staff. Awesome. There was an incredible human being named Kevin Smith and getting into Catholic was tough in its own. You know, because coming out of where I was at, city schools didn't want me a part of it. Webb didn't want me a part of it, be at their school. CAK didn't really want me a part of that. And, and so Catholic was really the only chance we had. So they gave me the first well, shot. Why didn't they want you to be? Uh... Um, so, you know, also um, growing up is we, you, uh, we got in a little tough spot. And it ended up me going into uh, government custody for two and a half years. And so coming out of that, they really didn't want me to go into public schools and that type of stuff. And so Catholic took the chance on it. Can we can we peel a, a little layer off yeah. the description tough yeah. spot? Yeah. 
Um, it was a uh, you know a bad decision that I made trusting somebody that really shouldn't have and in, in, in seek of some type of uh, um, you know where I grew up shy I was always in search of kind of that um, that affirmation that affirmation and, yep. and, and circuit that and when someone gave me that you know I, I'm a loyal person you you give me yours I'll give you mine till this day and I uh, made a bad decision and, and led to uh, um, uh, Led to two and a half years in, in state custody. Finally got out of all of that, and uh, you're this bad kid, yeah. and nobody wants to touch you. Yep. I mean, there's and, and a Catholic decides. Yep. We believe in redemption. Catholic said. Uh, so we had a meeting with uh, city schools. Nope, can't do it. Got to go to alternative schools. All right. So we go to to Webb. Okay. Hey, I'm sorry. You know, we'll talk about it next year. Go to CAK. Hey. You know, we'll have a meeting on it in three weeks, can't promise you anything. We go to Catholic, sit down, meet with the principal, Mr. Somberak, um, meet with a bunch of school officials, uh, two to three hours, same day that, that we came in. And, um, and, and the principal at the time, who ended up being my confirmation sponsor, basically said, you know what, I believe in him, I'm going to give him a chance. And, and really that's the story of my life. It's always that one person that says, I believe in you. Yep. I'm going to give you a chance or a second chance. Yep. And, and so um, Catholic did that. And we made the, uh, or, or I made the most of that opportunity. And then again, Coach Kevin Smith, who's my position coach at, at Catholic, basically said, hey, uh, you know, give me everything you got. I'm going to get you a free education. I said, great. I said, let's do it. And, uh, and so I had to give him $200. And after my junior season, he made a highlight film. I didn't even think I was good enough to have a highlight film that year. And he sent it out. And then the mail started coming in. And then I ended up getting, I think it was 28 offers. 28 yeah. offers? 28 different offers. And uh, um, the crazy thing about it is, you know, because again, you, uh, and this is the other thing, you can't outrun who you are, your past. You know, I always think you hit it head on and, and go through it. And uh, um, I lost 27 of them because when they found out about, hey, he's been through this, he's been through this. Now nah, we don't want to do it. Too much of a media hassle. We don't want to deal with it. But, you know, that was at the time that former, um, of course, got his, was fired. Kiffin was coming in. I went and met with Coach Kiffin. Kiffin comes in. Hey, here's a, uh, we spent two and a half hours together. And Kiffin said, I'm gonna get you into University of Tennessee. And we had to meet with, you know, the AD, the chancellor, you know, the student affairs and all these people. But we finally got in. Uh, under that, um, and that was just the start of the UT career, which ended up probably one of the craziest five years in UT history, and probably the craziest three or four years in my personal life ever. It, it looks like this tough spot yeah. kept putting you in the right spot. It did, it actually did, and that's the one thing that, you know, you always hurt for people that are victims of a situation. Still to this day, you always hurt for, for that stuff, but you realize too that, hey, it's really one of the best things that ever happened to me. It got me out of a situation, put me somewhere else. Had to start, you know, I've lived by myself now since I was 13 years old. And getting you from that time, becoming a man, knowing what your standards are, knowing what your expectations are, um, developing kind of your, your moral code and, and that type of stuff um, was, was awesome. And, and it set the foundation for what I'm doing today. What does that do to your heart? And I know yeah. how it resets your mind to be yeah. on your own since 13, right. but what, is it, what does that do to your heart? Does it put you in a position where you're like, you always never know who's gonna be there for you, so you figure out, number one, I better be there for myself? Um, you know, it, it's, I think that I, I have a way more optimistic view, and it's, uh, I, I, I always say that, um, you know, happiness is really defined between what your expectations are and then reality. And so if it's a little better than what your expectations were, that's what we call happiness. If it's a little lower, they say, hey, you're probably sad and that type of stuff. And so um, so what I always did is I set my expectations low, but I always committed 100% to the people that were around me, so Some, sometimes to a fault. And, 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 um, and, and so with that, um, you know, I love everyone 100%, and those people give back. And so by doing that, you know, I've got people that are in, invested in me. 
and I've got people that I'm personally invested in me that, you know, when they call my phone, yeah, they know I'm picking up. Yeah, when I know. call them, they got you, my back. This is Daniel Hood. We're going to take a break. Oh, we haven't even gotten into the, the meat and potatoes. There's some <laughs> Salisbury steak to this story, and you'll hear it coming up in just a moment. This is Anything is Possible. More in a moment. Coming up. Even playing at Tennessee, that was that was a dream. That was a goal. And once I hit that, I, I knew that my career would be done the day I stopped at UT. You said we were just basically present in our lives in Kingsport. Mm -hmm. uh, the aspiration was maybe we could move up from 10 cent Fridays yeah. to 59 <laughs> cent. <laughs> Get exactly. the full price stuff, oh, yeah. right? Oh yeah. <laughs> So you're sitting here today, uh, you own a company and uh, that I hear is doing really well and, and I thank you for being here today. We stopped as, as you're at the University mm -hmm. of Tennessee, Lane Kiffin takes a, gives you a chance. The Correct. folks at Catholic High School gave yeah. you a, a chance. You decided to make the most of that opportunity. You're playing at the University of Tennessee and having a lot of success. Were you imagining going to the next level? Were you thinking about the NFL? You know, the great thing about my family is we were all really close. I mean, divided up, everything else, a bunch of mixed match from everything from, anyway, um, but we're always grounded. And, you know, the one thing is everything in life, you gotta have that moment where you say, you know what, enough's enough, I can walk away. And so even playing at Tennessee, that was, that was a dream, that was a goal. And once I hit that, I, I knew that my career would be done the day I stopped at UT. And- Really? Yep. And uh, I knew that coming in, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, in college, you know, I, I was a, I think a five-time All-SEC academic honor roll type person. Um, I never missed a class, I think, in my entire college career. I graduated 3.4, 3.5. Um, I took count, uh, count two and three as electives, just because, you know, we all, education was a huge part, but um, you always gotta have that moment where you can walk away, be satisfied, with what you what you've done and what you're doing, um, and, and getting to hear your name over the intercom at UT, I still remember the first time I have it. You know, tears coming down. I remember running out of the T the first time. You get to see a one hundred two four fifty five all around you, <laughs> and uh, um, you didn't say one hundred two. You said one hundred two four fifty five. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Right? You know that I've touched every single state or step in that stadium and, and earned the right to to wear that. And so by doing that, I show the respect and I know what it is. And I remember coming out, I remember seeing, I get chill bumps thinking about it and I can still feel it, um, that night game. And God, it was just so beautiful. Um, and, and that was the, fun, the moment where, you know, everything that, um, that I'd went through up until that point, and, and there's stuff, I mean, almost dying, you know, six, seven times, you know, going through the tough spot, changing cities, uh, mom having cancer, you know, dad having issues, grandfather having a stroke. At that moment in time, I said, that's the definition of perfection, yeah. and getting to run out there. And then I got to play later, and so it just kept getting better. It just got better. You said you almost died a few times. Oh yeah, a bunch of times, a whole bunch of times. Tell me a couple of stories. Um, the first one, uh, brother and I racing big wheels. <laughs> I don't know if you, you know, the one that had the big and the yeah, front absolutely. two and the small. Yeah, always, oh, yeah. always been competitive. You know, like I said, sports was my, that was my equalizer. So we're racing down this hill at grandmother's house, having a good time. I look back because my brother was stopping for some reason. He was a little older than me, so he probably seen it. I didn't. <laughs> um, and next thing I know is uh, I got hit by a car, um, the, the back tire of the car came within centimeters of crushing my rib cage, which would have killed me. Um, had road rash, had half my face, you know, so they did a great job on, on makeup today. But <laughs> uh, luckily it grew back. Um, there's another time, fell through uh, ice, got trapped under ice. Someone had to break through to actually pull me out. You trapped under yeah. ice? What happened yeah. with that? It was just, you know, again, out having fun with uh, um, some family friends of mine. And we're walking on this ice because, we, you know, we've seen it in movies. You gotta, you know, you gotta have a good time. And uh, I went through, and so they literally had to dive in after me to, to pull me out. Um, we've had situations where I had gasoline. That was actually, um, uh, I was I always loved to climb as a kid, so I'm climbing a shelf. The gasoline flipped over, I actually poured, drenched my whole body, and to the point that it almost caught a fire, and that that caused a bunch of issues. Um, so let me ask you this: Why, yeah. why do you think 
Where do you think God preserved you? Um, that at this point, you know, again, I, I don't know. I mean, I know that my one goal in life and, and that I kind of gauge whether my success or failure is have I helped somebody else? Because that was, that was always the thing that got me to where I am. Somebody reached out a hand to help me. And so am I doing that same thing? And um, I don't try to act like I know everything. I don't try to understand that plan or anything like that. All I do is I live each day and then um, I've got golf balls at my office of people that we've helped. I've got golf balls at the office of people that we couldn't help that, you know, I, I still think about to this day that I want to. Uh, just to really, to, to put it in perspective, to put it in a visual and to know that's success or failure, you know, because whatever happens, you know, when we die and that type of stuff is, that'll be figured out at that point. But what are you doing with... What are you doing with the here and the now? Exactly. So when we come back, uh, I want to, you had a really special relationship with your mom. Correct. And folks, on part two of my interview, interview with Daniel Hood, uh, we're going to explore a really powerful story and that powerful relationship between you and your mom. You do not want to miss uh, the next episode, part two. This is Anything is Possible. That's Daniel Hood. More possibility next time.